Welcome everyone. It's my great honor to say that the course What is Philosophy developed and taught by my colleague Philip Niklas was just completed this past weekend and participants of the course gathered on Saturday to present their talks on what they've learned in the course. This is a very good introductory course to anyone who's new to philosophy or also people who've been reading philosophy but want to understand some more of the methodology of philosophy. So we'll teach uh, probably the course again next year. And in the meantime, if you want to study this however on your own, then you can enroll in the course and you get access to all study materials, meaning excerpts of the texts considered for educational purposes. But you also get access to the recordings of the group seminars which there were five. So just follow the link down below in the description and you can study on your own time at your own pace if you'd like to learn more about the method and um, the aims of philosophy. And now um, feel free to listen to the talks by the students in Philip's course. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody to this uh, pro seminar of uh, what is philosophy. The course is now ended and we are now going to hear presentations from uh, students who partook in the course. So throughout the past five or so weeks, we have been reading from Collingwood, from Hegel, from Anselm, from Aristotle, from Kant and Hume. And we have generally been um, examining and investigating just what is philosophy, what is peculiar to philosophy as a way of thinking, as a scientific discipline, as a way to figure out things about ourselves and the world. So without further ado, I welcome uh, Leonard, who will give us the first presentation. Yeah, thanks, uh, Philip. Uh, thank you all for the possibility. So uh, yeah, my talk is, oh yeah, it's, it's a sketch. A rift on the beginning and on beginning and it's like eight minutes or nine let's say and not directly on one specific uh, philosopher but yeah, more on the general theme so yeah i start uh, well we have to begin somehow even if it is not clear what this beginning and this act of beginning entails for let's say a proper beginning now so what does this mean proper beginning to begin properly well, there's no phenomena known to us, not revealed through experience of some form. And experience, it seems, is the inescapable extreme, which is somehow the accessible at all. Thus, experience is the all-encompassing sphere in which every phenomenon takes place with which one is confronted, and thus also those phenomena which one scientifically deals with. This does not mean that there may not be no possibility to draw a conclusion about things beyond the direct experience. So, for example, deferred, negative, phenomena are withdrawn. Um, but it means that any theory and any knowledge about these things can be based exclusively on the phenomena of experience and must therefore be evaluated by whether it overloads or overinterprets or overinterprets given phenomena or suppresses, maybe doesn't even take so the, the ex explication or explanation um, uh, or, or um, doesn't even take into account relevant parts of the phenomena. Thus, in experience, all phenomena are given that respective sciences take into consideration. Further, in experience, it is evident that evidence itself isn't subject totally arbitrary to change, but pertain with a kind of durability over time. In other words, objects of experience suggest recognizable systems of some sort, of a sort, which make scientific activity furthering systematicity possible, possible at all. It seems, nevertheless, as though we're starting with this erratic block. And yes, the allusion to the obelisk, monolith, the divine light object, black block, black box of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is appearing, which shows up there, reified as material trace, ramped remnant, an overdetermined object, one may could say, is not too far fetched. The scenes are hard to depict on, i.e., to read. How, by any means, is Moonwatcher, the ape leader, attentive after a night to a rather specific disposition of his field of perception? Why is the monolith at the wake of dawn an irritation, it seems, to the bounds of the extents of Moonwatcher's surround ring? On the screen appears a shot of the monolith with the sun rising over it and the crescent of the moon forming a specific alignment. 
a shot which so will precisely be countercut as Moonwatcher within a specific moment of concrescence of a blink of the eye, leaning over a bunch of bones and by an indicated suggested shift of perspective, takes on the bone and hit it on the ground. Now a bundle of questions are raised here. Firstly, Moonwatcher is alone in this scene. His tribe is not in the shown picture. Does it mean it is an act of ingeniosity? Secondly, he and his tribe is not yet in language, at least not in a way that would catch up to something like a symbolic order. Thirdly, what kind of role does the monolith, this is the image of the monolith, play in this? And fourthly, to outgo the classical tribe, what drives Moonwatcher to act in the first place? But as well, to not only take the bone, but to take it and hit with it, to pull, drive out, reach back, wind up and strike. So we have a lot here densely packed, to use or language as a virus from outer space, to borrow from William Burroughs, sunlight, moonlight reflection, the vertical and the horizontal as the lines or vectors of sight between a space of experience and a line of expectation, a horizon and a vertical tension, plus the technical, geometry, ideal forms, intuition, power and memory. In the Eureka moment, it is not the, mo the moment of first touch, respective contact that is shown, the raising up of courage to strive through that which lacks walkable access or the conquest of anxiety, but rather an upward directed look shot to the sky on which flat surface a diminishing sun withdraws on the verge, on the perfectly proportional and ordered image of the cutting edge of the line, of the top line of the monolith, staging the crescent of the sun as a mirror of the figure of the moon, much brighter, of course, as source of strong diffused lightning. It's, all, it's as if a stage were enacted by this view, this alignment, a particular point of an inscription of news, sun and moon face to face in alignment. How so we are looking in the night sky and not just seeing a bulk or bunch of stars, but a star formation. Nevertheless, as humeric as our hands, i.e. not to bring into identical congruence. Director Stanley's Kubrick, Stanley Kubrick stripped in form of a monolith, a figure in its sheer absolute minimum, a slab of geometrically perfect stone or metal that may have a lot to do, it seems, with today's smartphone, for example. The monolith may meant to be a physical present in the moment. It is shown on screen, an object placed, set by some alien relative to the apes. But perhaps it serves as an allegory, as though we were accommodating Moonwatcher, recalling the monolith innerly, showcased as monolithic experience. This difference carries out when one knows that the monolith itself was initially to be some sort of teaching machine and serves this function in Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 novel. Now the insertion of the image is in one-to-one -one shot. It's a cut to the exact same shot of the monolith shows, shown right before in the movie. A sound eureka moment, the spark lightning of having an idea, raising of one's eye. It makes the impression is coextensive with the film's image technical memory, a repetition to cut it short. Now herewith may it be that we're talking no longer about the film, so about the contents of the film, but in terms of the film as medium, moving image, a medium of movement, a time-based medium, may it be that we can conceive of the monolith at once as medium of metaphor and a metaphor of medium. So the image of the monolith, not as allegory of becoming human through inner reflection or remembrance, but a standing in for something else, namely repetitions, repetitive, repetitive aspect due to an inscription of material support. Well, what does this have to do with the beginning? To tackle the erratic block, i.e. the image of the erratic block, we make use of our language and so on something predicated outside of ourselves, a technic technical medium of shared socio-symbolic practice and combinatory work in terms of discrete elements, signifiers, and a infinite times infinite continuum in terms of the metaphor, every signifier can stand in for another. So in theory, but in theorizing a medium, there's specific, a specific conflict for we ignore the medium in its meaning generative quality if we understand it merely as an intentionally used tool or instrument. On the other side, if we focus solely on generativeness, productivity of the medium itself, here monolith, that is on what it is that gets transferred and the poles in between, which at all transference of some kind happens is formation and information. We're losing again the distinction, distinctiveness of the medium, which stands in between something and that there between it itself stands, green, Greek to metaxi. A metaphor, which always is a metaphor itself, so to carry over something, figurates herein as the fabricating manufacturing of something akin to a transference which is pointed or directed at sense, evocation of meaning, vertically. 
In contrast, horizontally, some interconnective circuitry, a rivaling of media, you could say, that isn't concerned with any overlaying of sense or an establishing production of coherent meaning, but is rather irrespective, nonchalant, of such autonomous structuring wholesome logic of sense or a nexus, overarching nexus. In other words, there may be more than the sole description of a medium as just this technical thing, so aspects of conduction, of intentionality, of directiveness, but the sense-making, sense-giving is drawn back, you could almost say confiscated by the medium, fully flat. For someone like Bernard Stiegler discussing for a big part Heidegger and Derrida, philosophy has no other question to answer at all than the question after techniques. And Derrida himself writes in Archive Fever, let's not start with the beginning and certainly not with the archive, but with the word archive and with the archive of such a familiar word. Uh, here, let us remember names at the same time, the beginning and the commandment. The paradox of a disseminated beginning, a beginning that lays not behind, not somewhere in the past, on a linear timeline, but rather seems compressed in all its reinstantiations on this plane of imminence. So if world entrances and, um, and its traces are in past, they rather having been there and are carried out and are sent over, witnesses and testimonials of having been there are the bag or baggage of a series of wrestlings with an erratic block, which appears like a hole in this shipping bag. So we engage the monolith uh, as the filmic image or filmic work, but we also said it may appear as an rating split in a way, an undesignable contradictive object between its real physical present and its constellation in terms of an allegory. Remember the monolithic experience, we called it. On the monolith, rather than on a stele, we get to see no inscription, only plain non-reflective surface etched by a perfectly shaped rectangle. This is the irritation factor involved in contrast to the surrounding. Even though we see no sign, we cannot but read other than its artifactuality. The monolith as hyphen, the signification mark, the signifier. Draw a distinction. So the event of revival, the shock, gets inaugurated by the distinction mark. At least this is one beginning of the second chapter of Spencer Brown, Laws of Forms. To make up a distinction, there must be a difference already at work. Now, there's a big tumult about how to pigeonhole such difference. Instead of identity dissipating difference, difference may also be constitutive of identity. But here at this point, may it be in terms of language or else, the split gets traced in terms of the psyche as a sexual difference, for example, which is yawning because it is premised on two different kinds of logic, namely the logic of exception and the logic of impossibility, with a figure that neither falls for one side nor as a third figure, for it interrupts itself and is bound to a type of object functionally similar to 2001's monolith. The end is now. On this terrain, we've done, uh, we, we have to do with a psychically folded territory, so symbolic and imaginary, in which reality is presented and the real can just be represented, but it's actually the unfolded negativity at the core that erupts retrospectively as parallactic shifts. As well, we have to concern ourselves with the flow of matter that appears signals, a metaphor for material transferences, i.e. time, i.e. differentiality, that epitomize our data, which is not something given, but something measured, and in which the agent of data or big data performs at least as double agent, carrier, and as such as assignee and consign consigner at once. This flint, stone, or black shirt, which carves and reliefs the terrain and question for the begin and question which carves the terrain and the question for the beginning becomes the question after the beginning and of another or an other beginning, a question philosophy seems preoccupied with. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leonard. That was really great. Pretty Thank intense you. and rich. Uh, is it all right if we ask you questions? Are you, are you okay with that? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can answer, but yeah. We can. Yeah. Do people have uh, questions? So I, I'm not sure yet how to formulate it, but what really stimulated me was your, your circumambulation of repetition with respect to the media, and especially thinking about it, the entirety as medial, the medium. Um, because I've been thinking a lot about the difference between reciting and discoursing. So maybe you could say something about the relationship between repetition as seen through an investigation of the medium versus repetition that is endemic to the plot of the film or what is within the parts, components of some artifact of a medium.
um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a different focus, I guess. Firstly, so um, but it's it's the precise same image which flickers up. I don't know if you saw the movie, but yeah, if um, the the uh, like um, moon watcher like um, lands or leans over the, these bones, and then there is like a flickering up of an image that that already occurred, and so. In, and, but it, it only flickers up and, and before it was shown like more intensely. And um, yeah, so in a sense, right, it, um, so yeah, it's a repetition, but then, I mean, it's an interesting to think of it as like a, right, a time image because um, like in, in the first um, shot, it's like really, it's uh, focused for longer, like for a few seconds. And yeah, you get, certain like um yeah um possibilities or thoughts are raised probably um because there's this um pre precise or like specific alignment um of uh, like the sun the moon and the monolith and and later it's it's only flickering up and yeah i would i would say so so it's it's the question how to repeat right um and uh and then, then again, like what, what is the difference between these two um, insertions or like image presentations, you could say, I guess. So uh, the first is, is longer, is more intense. Something is happening there. And then the second has other, it's the same image, but it has other implications because it's like flickering up. Um, it's precisely uh, in this um, ambiguity, I would say that something is happening in terms of yeah like the repetition in terms of the medium film may i ask one more follow-up question yeah go ahead okay so to that is is there do you have a do you have a, a place that you would put and i mean this very broadly the negative so in comparing those two images i'm thinking in terms of phenomenological intention so the viewer has a certain intention towards the medium, the two images, whereas the technique within the medium allows for, affords the timestamp, the pause, which kind of has a drawing in factor possibly. And this seems to be built in relation to a presupposed intention of a possible viewer. And I wonder if in somewhere in that mix, there's a there's a place for the negative. Whereas, so the, the timestamp where things are paused, there's delay versus the other one where it flickers. Is there a sense in which one does not possess what the other has? And so it's a negation of the one, even though it's the same object. And so it's a repetition with negation. Is, does negation factor in somewhere with this, as you see? And that's my last question. Yeah. I I mean, I would, I would say, um, yeah, negation is playing in there and like, I mean, is at least, uh, thought provoking in there and yeah. So, so this was kind of the, um, yeah, I don't know, the kind of bottom line of, of, um, of the writing, uh, or thought I, I followed, like where to put negation and, um, and what does this mean? Like, um, yeah, if, if one could like, uh, radicalize it and, and say perhaps that, you know, this, this terms of um, mediation in an extreme form is negativity. And then, um, yeah, so it's, it's, but then it's a really different thing. So, but yeah, this was in terms of philosophy, like a question I, uh, yeah, I, I waste and for myself. So. Thank you. Uh, so I have a much more maybe basic question, but so do you see the monolith as being a kind of artistic rendition of what, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, what for philosophers are categories, right? So like the monolith comes with these geometrical perfect forms and so on, right? Which cannot be found anywhere else. And in that respect, you said something, I think, at some point that it's sort of there, it's there to teach the the beings around it that, you know, here I am, look at, you know, these uh, perfect forms, shape, and so on. So do you see it, so, you know, 
serving that sort of function, a kind of physical manifestation of <laughs> philosophical categories? Yeah. On, so yeah, I think in the in the novel, it it's it serves kind of the function as a learning machine. So and yeah, that's pretty interesting. So yeah, in a way, in on like uh, on the layer of like the image representation or the representative uh, content, let's say, um, you could almost say yeah that it. I don't know if it's yeah. I had more to think about it. I guess. Yeah, because it, it, there is a twist here, right? Because like philosophical categories aren't instantiated outside of us. They are, you know, within us, they're imminent. They're, if they are learning like teaching machines, they're teaching machines within us. But I think this is what is nice about art is that they can play around with that. And, you know, let's pretend they're actually physical objects and, um, you know, turn, around, turn things around like that way. But thanks, Leonard. That yeah, was a really provocative talk. Okay, I think we should move on to our next speaker. It's uh, Lou. Lou, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, part of an essay that is in the book we used for the course, we use Collingwood's, an essay on philosophical method, uh, but it also had some manuscripts that I guess came out of the Collingwood archive um, and one of these uh, manuscripts is an essay on, on F.H. Bradley, Francis Herbert Bradley. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about the section called Bradley and Modern Physics. That was an intriguing title, so I read that and then prepared a little bit. So um, what I'm going to recount is kind of Collingwood's uh, history. He's got, a, he's got a very interesting history of, of philosophy, at least as he writes here. Um, one that I haven't really heard before. And so I'm not going to try and like critique his history of philosophy or say, actually, that doesn't seem correct. I'm just going to give him, you know, the most charitable, you know, uh, exposition I can of it. And then afterwards, we can, we can maybe talk about what, what we might disagree with or, or agree with. Um, okay, so he, he really thinks that the modern epoch of philosophy and science begins with Galileo. And what's relevant in this part here, he says, is Galileo's a revival of something that uh, the Greek philosopher Epicurus talked about, which is that primary qualities of objects, those are the real, those are real things. So a primary quality is like a body being extended, the body having a certain size, body having a certain mass, basically all the things that are measurable about you know, an object. The, that, that's real. And what is illusory, what is mere appearance, um, according to Collingwood uh, on Galileo, is things like taste, touch, smell. All of these things are merely subjective. And so uh, Collingwood thinks that this was like the beginning. And then Descartes, of, of course, continues this, um, the beginning of philosophy and science. And this is what allow, has allowed science to achieve so much is that it's not worried about these merely subjective qualities. It's just looking at things that are measurable. And um, he thinks that uh, in the 17th century, so the age of the Baroque, the age of Newton, of Locke, um, really science and philosophy, or, or he says metaphysics, science and metaphysics were very close. You can think about somebody like Leibniz, who was, is he really a scientist? Is he a mathematician? Is he a metaphysician? Like he's all of these things. And there's kind of a, a, a great harmony. Um, for Collingwood, this really starts to break down with the skeptics and somebody like Bishop Barclay, who starts asking, you know, okay, science is studying material. It's giving us uh, an account of how the physical world, the material world operates but what if we just question that assumption that there is like a material world that that's real? Um, and uh, co calling what's the science kind of had to say that, yeah, we can't, we can't really uh, argue against that because then we would be going into um, metaphysics. So we agree. And so uh, for calling what at that point, science just says, we're just talking about appearances. 
We're only talking about phenomena. And whatever reality is behind these phenomena, we don't care. Uh, we don't have a story about that. That's, that's not interesting. And you can't say anything scientific about reality. So we're just looking at appearances. Um, and I think this Collingwood doesn't say this, but this really culminates in like Kant's phenomena and noumena chapter, um, which we didn't look at in the course, but uh, is, I think uh, alluded to at least in the, the part we did read of Kant architectonic, um, where, you know, really in the empirical world is just phenomena. We can't attribute that whatever we perceive and, and it, whatever appears to us is the, is the reality of what things are in themselves. Um, and, and so, so this kind of dynamic continues. And so you have this very deep divide between appearance, what the subjective world that we're all in right now of like, okay, things appear of a certain color, of a certain hue, and a certain, you know, aspect, all of that stuff is just mere appearance. And somehow we need to reduce that or just call it illusory or just reduce it to, you know, actual physical material things going on. Um, man, and we, we can still see a lot of tendencies in these. Uh, now, I think that's kind of a somewhat normal history of, of early modern philosophy, at least, you know, you, you hear accounts like that. What's interesting, though, is when we get to the 19th century, um, and uh, Collingwood says that uh, there was a revolution in 1895, or the beginning of a revolution in physics, when, I guess, an account of electrons and, and a proper account of the atom really began and this kind of kicked off the, the quantum movement, but also uh, Einstein's relativity. And Collingwood says this is like very much a transformation in the, the old physics that went back to Newton in the 17th century, right? But then pretty amazing, he says, so that was in 1895. He's like, but in 1893, there was an equally significant revolution. And that was Bradley, F.H. Bradley published Appearance in Reality in 1893. Collingwood says, like, is this, is this a mere coincidence that these two momentous events happen so close to one another? Because he agrees, that, like, they, they, they don't care about each other. Philosophy and science have been so divorced that it's not like the physicists are reading Bradley and Bradley isn't necessarily reading the latest physics. But Collingwood says this is basically like a zeitgeist. Like, these are both expressions of what's going on in our age. And what is going on? Well, it goes back to that that first chapter we read in the class overlap. Um, you cannot talk about appearance without talking about reality. You can't talk about reality without talking about something that appears. And he really sees Bradley as what he calls ending subjectivism. So ending this idea that subjectivity has no access to obje objectivity, how things are. And how Bradley does this is say that appearances are part of reality. Um, they aren't reality itself, but appearances are in some essential way in reality, and reality in some essential way appears. And this is in something called the whole, or Bradley calls it the absolute. Um, and, and it's pretty, I mean, uh, uh, Collingwood's um, plaudits for this text are, are pretty amazing. He says it's the he says, it is certainly the most significant text in the past 50 years of English philosophy. And according to him, and he thinks uh, uh, perceptive readers, it's the most significant English philosophy book written since David Hume. Um, now, this is all pretty amazing because Bradley has been totally like basically cleared from history books. But he also relates, it's, it's fascinating that every single um, important figure in early 20th century uh, Ber uh, English philosophy, so Bertrand Russell, G.E. Moore, uh, the Oxford realists who taught Gilbert Weil, all these things, they were all students of Bradley. And Collingwood basically says they're all reacting to Bradley. Um, and so he really sees them as the pivotal moment in, in modern uh, English speaking philosophy. Um, and so what Bradley has managed to do is end this. Uh, this thing that began with Galileo, where uh, basically there's appearances and then reality and never the twain shall meet and we can't talk about them. Um, for Bradley, 
reality is essentially implicated in any appearance and any appearance is essentially implicated in reality in this something called the absolute. I'm not going to go too much into, into depth about uh, Bradley himself, but uh, this is Collingwood's uh, history of, uh, of, of modern uh, English speaking philosophy. Um, he tells us that Bradley, uh, this is sort of gives you reality would not be a reality if it did not appear. And appearance would not be appearance if it wasn't real. Um, both are implicated in trying to think the whole, trying to think the, the absolute. Um, now, what's, what's a very interesting note at the end uh, of his account, um, by the way, the reason he thinks that this revolution is similar, uh, Bradley's revolution in metaphysics is similar to what's happened in physics is because he thinks that the new physics, like relativity, also wants to take account of appearances. So he talks about reference frames in Einstein relativity, how um, the mo relative motion and absolute motion are actually one and the same. Um, so before, you know, relative motion is just what an observer might see, but there, there's some quality, important quality to take account of that in, 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 even in an absolute sense. You can see that the concepts kind of overlap. It's hard to really uh, talk about one without talking about the other. And then, of course, in quantum physics, the issues with measurement that are coming up uh, in Collingwood's time. Um, all of this kind of implicates the self that was thought to basically be the realm of illusion of, of mere appearance. It's actually implicated in determination of, of reality. Um, and so just uh, on a last note, um, Collingwood kind of ends on a hopeful note. He thinks that because these are two kind of kindred spirits in the zeitgeist of overcoming the appearance and reality um, divorce separation. He's very hopeful that philosophers and physicists will begin to have very productive conversations. And he's like, I, he's like, this is all tentative. He's like, but I hope that this will lead to, you know, just like in the 17th century when science and metaphysics were tightly wound, hopefully this, in this new time, you know, in the 20th century, we might see that happen again. And it's amazing how that, absolutely did not happen. Like Collingwood's hopes were totally dashed, at least in my interpretation. You have positivisms, end of, met forget metaphysics. Um, and the person who he's talking about, Bradley, has been totally, totally neglected. There's a hilarious essay by the writer David Stove called uh, British Idealism, a Victorian Horror Story. And he just is like aghast that like England was like a British idealist, you know, <laughs> had British idealism as its, uh, as its Victorian philosophy. Like these were the philosophers of the Victorian age with these like strange, like German, German inspired uh, idealists. Um, and so if Bradley is even discussed at all, he's like, just as, oh, that was like a really aberrant, strange period in, in English philosophy that is uh, from a bygone age we best forget. Um, I mean, I've been trying for like, a couple of years now, just to try and get a copy of Bradley's collected works, and it's out of print everywhere. You can't buy it in England. You can't buy it in North America. It's if anybody comes across it, I would please let me know. Um, it's basically totally, totally neglected. So this is really a, an amazing little document because it, it's kind of a glimpse of not only a different time, you know, Collingwood's time when he would have these expectations that philosophy and science might have a more profitable relationship, but also this history of philosophy where Bradley is like this pivotal figure um, that really is the fulcrum on which, you know, the past is overcome from Galileo and then the new, you know, analytic philosophy and, and what and positivist philosophy is reacting against Bradley. Um, so I just found that remarkable. And I think it, you know, touched on a few, few themes of the course, especially overlap, um, you know, where it, you, you can't neatly, uh, as, as Collingwood says, philosophy is trying to do before Bradley, you can't neatly separate appearance and reality. Um, they're, they're essentially, you talk about one, you must talk about the other. So anyway, uh, that's all I have for now. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Lou. That was really great. Seems like uh, the most radical thing to do nowadays is to just go back and read Bradley, right? 
Well, ex exactly when no one else is, is doing, nobody else is doing it. It certainly piques your curiosity of like, wow, who, maybe he's a forgotten treasure, you know, or maybe he's working. Maybe it's good that he's forgotten. Want to that check. was only one way to find out, right? I just had a question. Um, I definitely, I want to check out some more Bradley. Can you just help clarify for me on Galileo? Um, as, um, I don't know a lot about him, but I understand that he's, along with Copernicus, one of the um, heliocentric people. And I, so, but can you just tell me how he um, ushered in this, this change um, where appearance was becoming separated from reality? Um, is, the, is the model of the solar system one of them? or Certainly that's, and, and Collingwood even mentions this, certainly that is an important point. Um, when we look up, we, we, we say the words, the sun rises, the sun sets, but actually we're moving, the earth is moving. And so it's actually an illusion. The sunsets are an illusion. They're merely an appearance. They're not the reality of what's actually happening. And wow. so Galileo is part of that. And I mean, I'm not anywhere near like, you know, well-versed in Galileo, but he's, he's I, I think he is the first person to represent time as a line, like to, 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 to draw a line and split it up into seconds and then use that to, you know, uh, for like a scientific diagram or a model. Um, wow. So, and, and he, he, he has trouble, you know, he has to justify this. Like why would time, which is something you can't see or perceive, why would we model that with a line, with a geometric thing? And he has to explain why this is and, and basically says that the reality of the world has a mathematical, you know, structure to it that we can't perceive. And what that means is that what we perceive is in some sense an illusion, just like the sun rising and the sun setting. Um, and then, you know, Galileo has many accomplishments. He did, you know, experiments, you know, I, th I think he approximated like um, the acceleration in, uh, of gravity, you, you know, many, many great accomplishments, but really a big step in mathematizing nature. Um, wow. I have a question. Please. Apart from the, let's say the opening of a conversation about idealism that would approximate um, reality and appearance that we, that's, that we can see that may, be an analytic, that may not be an analytic philosophy now, mm -hmm. you see it elsewhere. So what, what comes to my mind is now I believe there is a, a school of thought somewhere in France. Um, I heard it described as a theological turn, mm -hmm. and there are there are names attached to it. One though that I've been following is Jean, and I'm going to mispronounce it, Jean Ives Lacoste, and he wrote a book of maybe ten years ago, call and it's recently translated to English called Experience and the Absolute. Mm -hmm. And what he does that I find so interesting and why your use of the word absolute caught my attention was he takes something that was recently developed. Now, I'm no expert in it, but it was, he claims it was recently developed, algebraic topology. And he uses topology to talk about location and place in a way that marries reality and appearance. All things must be in a place, even our illusions. They are placed. And he does this with uh, something analogous to Galileo putting time on a line. He puts the appearance of things on a surface, right? And so like a cup is a surface and you can say something about its uniformity without an external theory, quote unquote, like you can, you can stay here. He thought you could stay with the appearance and have a grasp on reality. Now, I'm, I'm not doing him any justice, but he, I, I see him on the cutting edge of something new, and I wonder if it's idealism. Mm. That's it. Yeah, I don't know much about uh, 
about Lacoste specifically, but I, yeah, I, th I think it's um, where I've heard the term theological term uses like French, French phenomenology. It's like they, they begin, uh, I think it's like Jean-Luc Jean Nancy and, uh, and, and others, but, but I'll check that experience in the episode. That sounds like exactly like a, a British idealist title. Like <laughs> they all have titles like that. Um, and one thing, one, one, one difference there though, just from, just from what you said, um, the, specifically the British idealist, and I think idealism more generally is wary of, um, is wary of mathematical models as, as necessarily the right way to approach things because, uh, you know, mathematics itself would rest on, you know, axioms that they might say are, well, those are just hypotheses and we want something like the necessary, uh, uh, we want our knowledge about um, the absolute to have some sort of absolute quality to it, to, to be necessary, not just a hypothesis. Um, and so, so that would be my first thought. Um, but the, if we go just to like the word topology of like the Greek word topos, place, logos, account, or reason or something like that, um, that sounds very, very much like, like discussion of the absolute, uh, how a lot of these guys, Bradley do it is like, everything is like a fragment or a part in, in, in the absolute somehow. So even an appearance of, you know, if, if I see my reflection on a window and then, you know, somebody breaks the window, it's like, oh, that was just, you weren't actually in the window. That was just, you know, in a mere appearance. But in some sense, like that, that appearance and its meaning has a, has a place in the absolute um, where we would, might just say it was, you know, just light on the window or something. Um, and uh, so that, so that notion of like, a place where appearance is and that is in some sense because in the absolute in some sense on the same level as the physics underlying it um it's it's not a reduction of one to the other um and and it's not a, it's not a transformation it can it can be bent and warped but not cut yeah sorry to interrupt no no that that that, that sounds uh, that sounds promising, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll look at, look at that more. I mean, definitely, um, I showed this in uh, my discussion with Philip about uh, British idealism. I'll just get it one second. <laughs> this is a student of G. E. Moore, uh, Morton White, and it's it's just a book called the Oops, just a book called the Age of Analysis. It's about the history, like the recent history. This is written, I think, in like the fifties about you know modern uh, English, European philosophy, let's say. And if you look at the title of the first chapter, it's called The Decline and Fall of the Absolute. And so certainly there was this idea of like, talking about the absolute, that's like, this just sounds like religious or something like, certainly not scientific and perhaps not even philosophical. So we just need to get away from it. But if you go into most, you know, discussions of the absolute, uh, you find that they're, I find them very interesting and at least very helpful to, to think with um, as just as a starting point. Thank you for your question. So, um, Lou, you talked about how um, Bradley sort of um, shows that appearance and reality like implicate each other. Mm -hmm. and that there is a connection between them, uh, irreducible some connection between them, and that this suggests that they are part of a bigger whole. Mm -hmm. And is that whole then the absolute? Is that what he said? I mean, that's... I believe so. I, I don't want to say anything too, too definitive because um, okay. I'm honestly not super sure, but that that's how I'm reading it now, at least. Um, yeah. That...
Yeah, the absolute is sort of the whole that the totality that contains everything. <laughs> Reality and ideality. Except non-totality. Except non-totality. Yeah. Here, here's where you might, I mean, so at the beginning I said, um, this is an interesting because I would say that like really Hegel is the first person to really emphasize that, you know, what is essential or what is real must appear. Like there isn't, you know, reality and appearance, of course, are implicated. And so that's, you know, at least 60 years before Bradley uh, published his book. Um, yeah. So, so you can kind of, uh, you know, we might want to tweak Collingwood's history of like, who is the original, original person, but I don't, I honestly don't know how much Hegel Bradley actually read. So you might have just been coming into it, you know, stewing in the same, you know, reading a lot of Kant, that kind of thing. <laughs> well, because because uh, a lot of this does sound like it maps on or mirrors Hegel, because he has his own stuff in, in Doctor of Essence in the Science of Logic, where there's a, ch a, a chapter called Appearance, right? And there he goes into working out the distinction of appearance and then the world in and of itself, right? What you might call reality. And then he figures out, well, actually, these are implicating each other, but then this leads to an essential relation. And then, then that unpacks uh, force and expression. Um, no, first whole and parts, then force and expression, and then inner and outer. And then once you understand inner and outer to be implicating each other and to be forming part of the same thing, then you get actuality, the immediacy of which is the absolute. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I'd be, you know, it'd be interesting to look deeper into Bar uh, Bradley and to see, like, you know, because how how well it this sort of maps, up. like, yeah. basically a comparative <laughs> study between the two. Yeah, and I know, I mean, there probably is somebody who's done that somewhere, but I haven't found it yet. Um, I think that'd be really interesting, and it it's so something uh, that Collingwood said reminded me a bit of Hegel because uh, Hegel will say that like all of these opponents of, you know, idealism, they're actually idealists. They don't, they don't realize, you know, you know, being a materialist, it's like, oh, you you really are into the concept of material, right? You know, you think that. And so, you know, being an, an unwitting um, idealist, Collingwood says the same thing about, you know, Russell, Moore, Pritchard, John Cook Wilson, uh, all of these uh, pupils who then turn against Bradley. He's like, they all basically accept his assumptions and are just trying to work out a different way because they all agree that yeah appearance and reality must be connected they all agree that in some sense um they you've got to work out how they're connected and what it mean what it means that we have these distinction between like primary and secondary qualities but none of them want to talk about the absolute they absolutely want to decline and fall right they get rid of that discussion so um it's you know i mentioned this elsewhere but it's like these, these moments in philosophy are repeating each other. And so I kind of agree with his zeitgeist theory of like, you know, just the zeitgeist will produce the same <laughs> dynamics. Yeah, un unless it's, you know, dealt with properly once and for all. Yeah. Um, so I have oh, a, a quick follow-up. Oh, go on, sorry. Thanks, Steve. I'll, I just, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so, um, so, you know, uh, appearances ha have a well appearance and reality you know there is there is something negative with with saying something is an appearance right because mm -hmm. what is most immediate is not is not something that appears you you seeing it as an appearance means you've already you're already sort of negating what it is that it's immediate and you're mm -hmm. seeing it in light of something else right and so you're already presupposing or you know, anticipating this non-appearing something out of which this, this appearance then is the appearing part, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And and for Hegel, he was like very aware that, yeah, this is very, very much a negative, negative thing. And then when we start to talk about the reality behind appearances, that is just a negative on the negative, right? Um but there's nothing straightforward about any of these these terms. So I'm just wondering if you know anything about how Bradley thought about it, or if he if he has more sort of immediate relationship with them, in the, in the, in like the same way Kant has. Yeah, it's uh, 
it's very interesting because they use all of these similar terms, but in their own like slightly tweaks a bit. So for example, um, there's a great uh, uh, podcast if you search Australian idealism. So because it was a British empire in the 19th century, um, you know, idealism was everywhere. It was in New Zealand, it was in Canada, it was in Australia. And this guy who was a, a student in like the 50s or 60s of a famous Australian philosopher, he said like, um, the, 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 I think this guy's name is Anderson. And he said, Anderson would spend lectures and lectures railing against the notion, the doctrine of internal relations. And this guy in the podcast who was his student was like, I have never heard anybody advocate this doctrine of internal relations. And I don't know what he's talking about, but later on he learned, oh, that's Bradley. And so Bradley became famous because he had a dispute over this notion of relations, what a relation is, because a relation is, you know, what connects everything. And so uh, all of that to say is that, um, for example, he talk, Bradley talks about uh, immediacy, the immediate moment of um, so, sort of impression, and that is uh, relationless. And I haven't really worked out what he means by that, but um, basically you can't say anything about the immediate. Um, and so that sounds like you can't really know anything about it because if we can't say anything, do we really have concepts about the immediate? Um, but that would seem to plunge us into, you know, well, we're constantly in a world of, you know, the immediate impressing itself upon us. So how then do we have things like knowledge and, you know, substantiality? And, uh, and so he, he, he develops all of these things. Um, but with appearance specifically, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I haven't uh, read it closely enough yet to say um, like exactly how he would define appearance, but it would certainly have to do something with immediacy and mediation um, and what that implies. You know, if something is mediated, then that means there's a sort of uh, element or medium in which something is being transferred. Um, anyway. <laughs> All right. So, you know, look out, Talkian, for a Bradley reading group. That's right. <laughs> All right, Steve, you, you wanted to jump in? Oh, well, I, I was just going to ask a hopefully quick one, uh, just about the word the absolute. Um, what what are the origins of this? Um, do, is, mm. Does this begin with um, Bradley in that context of the absolute, or is there someone um, before? Does anyone know? Who... Yeah, that's a good, I mean... Uh, Philip or anyone else might know more about this, but um, I believe it's, I mean, the furthest back I know for sure is, is certainly Kant who starts talking about the absolute, but yeah, that, that's a good question. I'd want to know like before that, who, who talked, if it comes out of like, cause that, cause uh, Newton or at least Newton's followers, they talk about things like absolute space and time. So I'm thinking of the like early uses of the word absolute. Yeah. Well, you happen to know Philip? Yeah, I'm not not too good on the the history of that. Mm -hmm. But um, Kant surely uh, for sure uses the absolute, but he doesn't really thematize it, right? It's not really a, a theme for him. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really becomes a theme for Schelling. Um, maybe Fichte too. I'm not too sure. I haven't read too much Fichte to, to confirm that. But definitely Schelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, possibly also Hölderlin. But it seems to me like a very German thing. I could be completely wrong here, but it seems like it, it happened there. That became like a big, big theme. Big concept. Yeah. In, um, uh, so the poet and philosopher Friedrich Hölderlin he he lost his mind i think he he they, we think it's like schizophrenia or something and he was living in a carpenter's like attic for after this episode for the rest of his life and he became like a tourist attraction you could go and visit him and he would like write you a poem anyway a journalist went there and like tried to interview him and then when he was leaving 
Colton and was like, I just want to say, uh, you know, do you have any other questions? And the guy was like, can you tell me about your time, you know, in the, in school? Cause you were roommates with Hegel and Schelling and the, this might be fanciful, but it's like, uh, the journalist said that Holderland just like stared straight ahead, like a thousand yard stare and just said, the absolute. <laughs> yeah, maybe that was the absolute that, you know, the, the, these three guys in the, in the Trinity. There, there were three and there were one. Okay, I think we should uh, move on then. To uh, Steve, you're up next. The floor is yours. It's going to be a hard act to follow, and just uh, as always, a light sorbet uh, in between courses. <laughs> but um, I just, I mean, I don't have anything um, substantial really. Just to, I wanted to hone in on the um, the interesting chapter to me on um, induction and deduction in the Collingwood book. That was a particular seminar and reading that that sort of stuck with me and, and stood out to me from the course. Um, and I, I just wanted to say that this course came at a, a good time for me. It seemed very, um, you know, like a good way to get into uh, the question of what is philosophy um, in, a, in an English. Uh, I'm, I'm not being a multilinguist, um, just in a, English, someone I could uh, re read and relate to very easily. Um, so, yeah, so it, we, um, we looked at um, these two ideas of induction and deduction. And it got me thinking about, you know, what raw material um, do we bring to uh, both deduction and deduction, um, deduction and induction. And, um, you know, these become the, the questions of what, what is fundamental and what do we take to be fundamental. Um, so in deduction, uh, we're looking at things uh, more from science, typically, and this is a more scientific approach um, because we're starting with basic axioms and basic solid um, calculations of one form or another, and then building uh, up a, um, a, a chain of deduction. This is a good example I printed out. It's um, it's uh, a deduction. It's a proof that's gone wrong because at the end it says two equals one. So that doesn't make sense. So <laughs> that's just a, an example there. Um, and you know, you you go through and you try and find where the mistake happened. But, but specifically, you can't go back through through the mistake. You, you, you can only go one way. Um, so um, whereas in philosophy, uh, and if we're taking a more inductive approach, um, you get to the end um, and then you can go back to the beginning and the conclusion can begin to support the, um, the initial axioms and assumptions in a way that a deductive train of reasoning can't do that. You have to go back and you have to keep going one way. Um, so that, that was one interesting way of trying to define, um, as at least as I understood it, the uh, one of the differences, one of the key differences between deduction and induction. Um, the other thing that, it, you know, I found very interesting at the beginning is like, well, this is really something very solid and like, um, I can I really have a good grounding on what I think induction and, and deduction means like I, I'm a reasonable person I can I'm on solid ground here I'm not sort of in in like uh, the middle of being in time or something no clue what what I'm <laughs> what I'm reading um, but um, so that was good for me and um, as it went on it became clear that it wasn't quite so straightforward when I started thinking about it because because of this problem is what we take to be the axioms and what we take to be true. Um, and so someone like, um, I, I just found an example of like Sam Harris saying that, uh, you know, the, the first three digits of pi, uh, 3.14 are gonna be true whether, um, you know, we're a billion years in the future on the other side of the universe, it's gonna be just as true as it is here today in Christchurch. Um, and so um, that is one very solid truth that we can use to build our um, deductive scheme upon um, and um, you know that seems like a, a solid ground um, and then uh, Jordan Peterson's answer to that um, was to talk about um, a micro truth or, or um, you know uh, we now have this term uh, post truth and it's something like the people who, who are using the word post truth um, 
Well, the true in that is not quite as true as they as they think it is, because the truth in it is already quite complicated, as it turns out, when we when we're looking at this problem um, about, you know, how we ground our scientific theories. Um, the people in, in the post-truth seem to be railing against the idea that there is a subjective truth and that we can create our own truths and create our own stable uh, realities based on positing certain um, assumptions. Um, and the only thing that's going to come along to um, dissuade people from that is sheer brute force. Um, and so this is where Nietzsche's maybe will to power comes into play. And it's maybe not quite so woolly as I thought it was in that, um, you know, when we're looking to ground and posit the beginnings of our, um, in, of our reasoning, we have to create these stable truths. And um, one approach might be to, um, yeah, to, to via brute force, um, put it into, into place. Um, when we, uh, when we deduce, however, too much in this way, Collingwood uses the analogy of putting an elephant on a tortoise um, because uh, we can build up very complicated um, deductions on something, um, you know, in terms of like a fundamental bedrock. It could be this massive thing, but he's sitting on a tortoise and that tortoise is maybe sitting on a tortoise and something smaller. And these are the assumptions of um, the scientific process. Um, what we find with induction is that we sort of are taking an intuition of something we already know and um, we're then going through reasoning we're inducting further and then when we come out to the end to our conclusion we can go back to the beginning and feel like the thing that we thought we know had become um, more detailed and more developed and um, richer and um, and I, this is always the problem I've ever found when I've tried ever to read philosophy is that it's the feeling of you have to sort of know it before you know it in order to know it. Or like you start reading a book and you're like, oh, I need to understand this <laughs> before I can start reading it. Um, <laughs> that's always been my experience. So um, but ultimately, um, when I'm reading these things, yeah, it does feel like I already knew it. And um, there was something really that rang true about it. Um, no, there's no morality. Um, I mean, I wanted also just to touch a little bit on, I'm making this distinction between maybe what you think of as num number or uh, scientific law and principles and thinking the, of them as inert, um, you know, entities that um, are sort of totally colourless. But, and, and then we're going to use them mechanically in, in a, some kind of calculation or deduction. But I really, I really feel like even these kind of truths have an ethic to them or an aesthetic to them that I can't properly describe. They, they're hieroglyphs that are alive somehow. Um, that's just always been my sense of it. Um, I just don't, I just can't look at them as purely cold things, but unfortunately I can't really um, unpack that much more. That's just a feeling. Um, so yeah, I just end by saying that um, Nietzsche's will to power allows us to create truths and posit truths that, in a sense, allows the victors to write the history. Um, and then within that, your countercultures and crevices, um, you know, create truths in the, in the, in the creases and crevices of, of, of other bigger truths. Um, so thanks very much for listening. And um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you and uh, do the course with you. Thanks, Steve. Those are really great, uh, insightful, interesting thoughts. Thanks. So um, something struck, like sort of struck me when you talked about uh, brute forcing things, right? And that's, you know, maybe, maybe it's not so much that it's being brute forced as in, you know, you're using force per se, but you're sort of tricking another person. You're using rhetoric or some other subtle thing, or you use some sort of thing they have against them, right? And that seems to me to be like opposite of rational discourse, where you sort of lay it out coldly and 
matter of factly and you sort of show them ah oh, this and so and so this is reasonable to do etc etc and one example of of the other part is like the advertising industry for the last 50 years right it's gone more and more away from you know uh, trying to offer you something sensible and sturdy and rational and more just like hey have this thing because it'll make you cool and you'll be popular right and so they're playing upon um drives and desires and and social cues and so on right so that seems to be you could say that uh, call that as a kind of form of brute forcing but it's also a kind of a form of cunning right mm. but is it irrational is it opposite rationality or is it just a different form of rationality right mm. it's definitely like a, what they what would be a me mimetic uh, desire where where you create something that um, it is high status to believe or to possess and um, uh, that would be um, but Leonard was talking earlier about um, how how we can know things beyond our own experience um, both through um, deduction and induction uh, inductive approaches you know we, we can begin to learn things um, that are beyond what we can empirically feel. Um, and yeah, and, and just on the subject, I guess, of the advertising then. Um, hmm, how do I fit that together? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure now. Um, it is rational. Yeah, that's the question. The question is, is it rational or irrational? Hmm. Or maybe you can put it like this, you know, brute forcing is also a kind of... Yeah rationality may be a very crude one but it's still you know effective in some respects it's great it's effective in creating um the terms on which we can um, begin to posit um basic ideas like a one or an a or you know in my in my list of things here i mean mm. all these things this you know it doesn't allow for a to be different over time it's just um once once you see the a there it means that a must always mean the same thing um and so even in these these things, we have a sort of brute forcing uh, approach, potentially, um, that uh, we build from. But no, that's given me some food for thought. I'm going to I'm going to think about that. <laughs> um, this reminds me, I'll be I'll try to be quick, but like it reminds me of a, of a guy I talked to recently who's a, a physics student and our mutual friend just started his master's and my other friend who just finished his master's says like the first guy who just started, he, he keeps asking so many questions, but those questions are obstacles because he's never getting down into the heart of the matter because he, he's just asking all these philosophical questions when he should just, you know, accept the theories and let them intuitively, you know, grow in, in his own understanding. That would be a much better way, but that does, you know, ask of him to just brute force his way to take for granted what's been given to him. Yes, that's what Collingwood calls the uh, the assumptions of um, what's the word? Yeah, the assumptions of science. But um, he had a better word for it. Uh, can't find it now. Um, hmm. Supposition, maybe. Supposition, yes, yeah, that would be that would be one, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, it's really fascinating and um, loads of thoughts. <laughs> did I did I understand you correctly, Steve? That uh, perhaps at an earlier point you were maybe put off by Nietzsche's will to power, but now you see something in it is that is that a fair yeah because before i was thinking that um well well compared to some philosophers this isn't a very detailed um system where he's going to deal with all the problems of, of physics and he's going to deal with with all the objections and you know your full index of where to go to when you've got this or that problem and so um uh, but then, I mean, uh, what I'm really keen to do again is to, is to try and take like fundamentals like music, say maths, a number, um, and try and 
mulch it all down in the compost in a way that connects it with with a kind of ethic or a morality somehow. Um, so these aren't the, these these are never just a sense of these are the building blocks. These are the our, our fundamentals, and then higher up we've got. We've got things like uh, beauty or whatever. It feels like they they need to be reconnected at the bottom, um, because yeah. So so it's you know I suppose Nietzsche with his very rhetorical style and his um, his aesthetics uh, you know talk, talks a lot about that kind of thing. I think that's absolutely crucial to everything we do when we when we're reasoning like this um, with yeah with with these different fundamental principles, but. So there's definitely a lot there. I was, I mean, I, I would say maybe Nietzsche is more of a um, intuitive, inductive type of thinker um, uh, compared to other philosophers. But I think, um, yeah, you can't you can't take the two apart from each other. My sense of things, anyway. Yeah. Hey, Amen. So I have a question with respect to completeness, and this touches on system from the course. And I know that you and I, a few weeks back, dialogued about the verticality of the higher and the lower. Hmm. And then when you were presenting the schema today, which I took as a, a representational object of a theme or a set of themes that you will treat, what struck me as unanswered because it was not asked and I will ask it now, is the middle term, the minor premise, the suspended, the suspended air between the sky, right, the inductive heaven, and the concluded ground. There is a middle, and this is analogous to a syllogism of the major and minor premise before conclusion. So I wonder, for the sake of completeness, how you see the theme for the middle? That is a great question. I mean, that that is one note that has totally been ringing ever since we discussed that, and that was your allusion to the um, Cartesian uh, mens rea, where we find ourselves in the middle of things. If I'm saying that correctly, um, uh, yeah, um, that is that that seems to be absolutely uh, critical to all of this. Um, that we are in the middle of it, as opposed to starting from a, a beginning. Um, yeah, I, mean, I like that between the sky and the earth. Um, and um, yeah, no, that's definitely been resonating me a lot, with me a lot. Um, uh, the other quote I was going to bring into it was um, the the future is a very difficult thing. To, oh, sorry, prediction is um, the hardest thing to predict is the future. <laughs> Yeah, um, which is, sounds sort of banal, but um, it's uh, it just shows that we can't build things up necessarily from um, you know from fundamental things because everything's always um, bringing more into it. Um, but yeah, I would love to say more about the middle. That seems like I would love to hear more about it. I think that's totally spot on. I, I guess why it jumped to my mind in response to your answer is Kant's distinction in the passage we read about the aggregate system versus the architectonic. And the architectonic has the principle of growth from within as opposed to incremental add-ons. So when you were talking about how hard the future is, which I think is a very fascinating statement, right? Because there's this impenetrability of it. There's this non-access to the middle of it. Mm. There's no, there's no vision for its um, expansion, which is quite strange because we, as it were, expand into it. So it's that that's a perhaps there's a there's a switch somewhere in there. The, the distinction between the architectonic and the aggregate, I suppose, is what motivated my question at heart. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to field that one, but if anyone else would like to, um, yeah. Um. Well, an aggregate is sort of indifferent. 
to its incremental increase or decrease. Still, still is an aggregate. Got a pile of something, add add two more things. It's still going to be a pile of pile of something. I Maybe uh, the architectonic, if there's an intrinsic principle, the principle itself was sensitive to the changes. Mm. Right. So, whether your limbs, you know, you move around your limbs a lot, you go hiking or running or so on, you know, the rest of your system will adjust and change accordingly and build, uh, you know, muscles and, and stamina and so forth. Or if you decide to, you know, read uh, Kant, you know, five hours a day, you you know, your brain will adjust eventually to to the demand. So you can almost think that the architectonic is, has a built-in plastic principle. Wow, yeah. Huh. More thoughts, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep on popping up as <laughs> <laughs> totally well i mean um it's all it feels all very a bit dilettantish to me from being but uh compared to the the others in the group but um you know it's amazingly flowering just flowers growing so yeah All right, thank you very much, Steve. We're, uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Is that all right with you? Oh, thanks. All right, so next one up is Matthew, and uh, we're going to walk with Logos through the centuries with him. Take, yes. take, us away, take us away, Matthew. Before I do, what is the name of Hegel's book where he talks about the actual, uh, the absolute after the actual that you mentioned earlier? The Science of Logic. Science of Logic. I mean, he talks about the multiple places. You can also find it in the Encyclopedia Logic, which is the abbreviated version. You know, the, the sort of summary book he carried, you know, gave his students and uh, accompany his lectures. But if you want the full, hard, deep end, you know, meditative uh, logic, immersive bit, then the sense logic. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hegel also has lectures on logic, which uh, can be helpful if you, if you need a bit more. And there are also like, tons of secondary literature I can also recommend if you, if you want to. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you in advance. <laughs> okay. This essay is entitled Waiting, Seeking, Waiting. Epigraph from a tragic comedy in two acts, Waiting for Godot. Pazo. Ah. Why couldn't you say so before? Why he doesn't make himself comfortable? Let's try and get this clear. Has he not the right to? Certainly he has. It follows that he doesn't want to. There's reasoning for you. And why doesn't he want to? Gentlemen, the reason is this. Vladimir to Estragon, make a note of this. Pazo. He wants to impress me so that I'll keep him. Do we look upon the infinite or does the infinite steal glances from us? How does the internal infinite compare with the external infinite? Is language the social worker with the oar of the river Styx waiting for our philosophers with their infinite concerns? What is clear and distinct with respect to the deepest idea? Which brick makes a house a house? How many waves does it take to make glass out of one of the rough hewn? Why is being univocal perfection to creatures such as we are? How is this not a conclusion, but the premise to a wide world of antique pens. Saint Anselm and Rene Descartes both looked at God and did not see what they were looking for. In the pious tradition of rigorous homologies, Anselm's topology was the chain of being's incremental acceptance. If you should grant some greatness to the grasshopper or perhaps to its sound at night, 
then you were inclined to find your way up the rungs to God himself. And this argument hinged on the signal recovery from the highest to the lowest and vice versa. Otherwise, it could be lost on the way home. Descartes drank Heracleitian water to the dregs of motion. Gone was the metaphorical as a replacement strategy, and out-out was the brief flame of alternating faith and understanding. To Descartes, the obvious truth was the understanding of existence itself, not the contours of magnificence. The place of the all in all in his scalar forms, which amounted to a thesaurus of introspection, was let go into a frontier beyond the senses to be given a brick fence by Immanuel Kant as a thing in itself, which possessed all the reflection in the world to reflect itself outside of our awareness, language, conception, and experience. Schelling stood before the audience members of a crowded lecture hall to pronounce something new and positive in Berlin. Soren Kierkegaard and Karl Marx were in attendance and both men had their own reasons for being there. Karl Marx was an enigma, first of all to himself and Soren furiously note-taking, eating the orange of the lecturer and leaving the rind on the floor could not have been more beside himself than he was at the blooming occasion of Schelling's Wissenschaft, long after Descartes' Meditations or St. Anselm's Fides Quorens Intellectum, when he said, the pure science of reason is then only negative, has nothing to do with existence, unless the actual comes quickly. The negative can and will be obscured, and the logical will be taken, assumed, for the actual content. Kierkegaard wrote Fear and Trembling, I believe, from the energy of Schelling's observation, in which he explored the possibilities of motion in the grain of Aristotle's kinesis in the anima, and its concentric reverb from the same place or what is a place in his community's library. This is where the psychological comes from in modernity. It is nourished by its contrary, nuclear physics. It is in this emphasis on movement that freedom relocates itself to the place of man from the extinct and abstract determinations of those who wrote and compiled the religions. It is in the treatment of a perspective in motion that enough momentum can be generated to outrun the modern nihilist bear for whom the honey of the promised land is insufficient. Thank you, Matthew. That was, that was really beautiful. Thank you, Rad. Thank you. I was really struck by the phrase, um, the which brick makes the house. Something I've been trying to, and this was on, uh, this was motivated by Lou, but it was embryonic through my reading of Kierkegaard's oeuvre, the place of mood in presentation. So somewhere in one of his earlier works, Husserl distinguished proper from improper presentation. And his example was a map to a place versus the place arriving. Because of course you have to take right turns, left turns, read signs along the way. And all the distance between puts in perspective the, the thing, which is all 
as it were, so many dominoes incremental far from the, the thing, the thing you are concerned with. And who knows along the way, this is perhaps where um, Steve's sense of the ethical blending in with the aesthetic, along the way, you might stop. And what, what seemed to be a logistic now is a temptation out of a discovery. And so he thought it was very important concerning intention that we know the difference between an improper presentation, which are many, and proper presentations, which are few and far between. And I thought, how could one educate oneself out of improper presentations? And I think mood has something to do with it. I think it's one of the reasons Kierkegaard wrote the way he did. I think it was his response to that quotation from Schelling about the double negation of the science of pure reason. First of all, the science of pure reason knows nothing. It concerns itself with, the, with negativity. And unless it does the next step and knows itself as negative, knows its negative knowledge negatively. And that's why I was so interested in what you said about science and logic from Hegel. Then it, it can spend its whole lifespan, the whole lifespan of the philosopher, awash in negativity, <laughs> awash in the improper presentation of external reality. And so the mood is a, maybe a way to know, and this is the last part I'll say, maybe mood is the way to know the pure science of reason as negative or to know itself as negative. And so that's why I used this polyphony was to try to surprise myself with um, evocative trails to, to maybe negate the negation. But I'm open to anyone else's suggestion about what could be outside mood as a helpful negating of the negation. That's one of my themes I'm really focused on. Well, that's a double negative. <laughs> so would that be a positive? Being a bit pithy there, sorry. Um, yeah. No, no, and that's, that's, why I was, that's why I'm so in love with the, the procedure because I think that's what Schelling meant by, and I don't know it in the German, but unless the actual comes quickly. So there's a sense of, and I think that's why I was so interested also in what Leonard said about the pausing of the frame versus the flicker. There's a sense of qualified time here, unless the actual comes quickly, then in that intervening, in the interval, your negative might be obscured and you might think it's not negative, mm. which would require you then to make the movement again of positing all as negative. And that, who knows if, if one would be willing to accept the repetition, the picking up of the, of the talisman again, of the skill set. And that, that, that little place before the first negative and the second negative, I, Kierkegaard thought most people lose their souls because <laughs> he, he, right, he was so concerned with the life sphere, with, with subjectivity and personhood. And I just, I just, I, I think it's a very interesting gap. Yeah. And you couldn't say it's just, um, there was a line at the beginning. I don't know if it was a reference to Shakespeare about the flame. Was it about a flame um, or uh, something? Uh, uh, it was towards the beginning. Um, yep, the out, out, brief candle. I think oh, that's oh, from. Oh. Oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what, what you couldn't give us the, the line again? Was it? Was it literally just the? Um, oh, so it's uh, gone was the metaphorical as a replacement strategy, and out, out was the brief flame of alternating faith and understanding, and that comes from, I forget what part in Shakespeare where he says out, out, brief candle. It's also a Robert Frost moment. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. If anyone remembers, it's not Macbeth. It can't be Macbeth. But... I think it is Macbeth. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Which I think, to my own mind, ties in analogously with Descartes' first meditation, right, where he sits beside the fire and uh, entertains the doubt of his own body. It's very proleptic. It's very Macbethian. But he keeps the fire going. He doesn't put it out. He lets the fire go and it melts the wax. Would you say more? Well, because I, and it's been a while since I read it, but like, 
you know, the wax appears in a certain solid form, but then if you let it out there by the fire, it's going to melt and it's going to take another form. Is it still the same thing, right? I guess it's the sort of a recasting of the, the, the ship of theses, I think, where, you know, uh, change the change the matter or the matter of so on arrangement is it still the same thing and so on. I think it's a, it's a different play on play on that. But anyway, the flame is kept on there and to perhaps disastrous result, he was staying in between the two negatives for, for a bit too long. But maybe that is exactly what, what has to be done, right? The, you have to linger with it for a certain time in order to, yeah, figure, get a, get a, get it clearly like what, what was the issue. But like with regards to, um, with regards to that, um, I think, a lot of all the most of the great philosophers always had their eyes on actuality and on ethics on, on practical concerns what's the good life and so on it's just they felt yeah we got to do metaphysics and logic you know do it do it first and figure out what reason is and so on so that we can do ethics and practical things and aesthetics better right this is kant's strategy this is hegel's strategy um you know you find it also in aristotle uh, it's not. It's never not that you were, you know. I don't. They were ever in danger of lingering too much in between the two negatives because they always wanted to get to the to the actuality. It was it was already there for them. It's just that they had to take this step back to understand better where it was they had arrived. <laughs> and I wish we had another hour because that maybe in brief. Then what? What is the integral role of desire in that instance? Because I was about to ask you, was it necessary for Hegel to write what he wrote in order to think what he thought? Or was it some other impulse, do you, do you, do you imagine? Was, as you said, did he arrive? He was there, and the writing was a sort of terrible word for it, reminder. But maybe there was a desire to entangle in language, to articulate, not entangle, to articulate. I mean, how, what, what was, because I, I so admire Hegel, hmm. and yet it, it was such an exercise. So where does desire, do you think, fit in? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think absolutely for, for Hegel and all the big philosophers, it must have been necessity. Hmm. Right? For them, it couldn't have been a question of, ah, I can do this, you know, later. No, no. This is being speaking to me, and I gotta listen. It's gotta, it's gotta come down now, or as quickly as possible. Because um, he wrote the phenomenology very quickly, didn't he? It was by necessity, <laughs> by pragmatics necessity, didn't he? Well, the same thing with the science of logic. That was also written fairly quickly, and it was written nighttime, as he had a day job as a headmaster, <laughs> plus raising a family. I was getting into that as well. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Yeah, so just, I think the key here is just just get really busy, extremely busy, like like you wouldn't believe, and then you will produce wonderful stuff. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is to give yourself too much time, too much space. No, no, no. It's the compression of space, the compression of time that, you know, cre creates diamonds. <laughs> it's true. That's true. I was imagining that he was living and breathing it every hour of the day, but it sounds like he had um, quite a busy life on top of that then. At that point of at that point of time, yes, yeah. It's amazing how mu <clears throat> how much good stuff is produced under those conditions, because yeah, I, I I literally imagine that you would literally breathe it, live and breathe every waking moment doing that, and you you think of other writers like maybe Kafka was was doing this insurance job when he was writing his great novels, and um, yeah, it's just striking, yeah. I had um, some questions for you, Matthew. One uh, uh, reference and then one more substantial. Um, was, was this, uh, do you know which, which lecture where Schelling says that the actual comes quickly or, or, the, or the book? Uh, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to look at that. Yeah, let me go grab it. I'll be right back. Just take two right. seconds.
it's an elevator music. So I like the the, the, the Howard Hong and Edna Hong translation okay. for Kierkegaard. Okay. And it this is the concept of irony with notes on Schelling's Berlin lectures. So that's where you can oh, get it. Cool. So get it in the concept of irony. Very cool. And it is in, well, I mean, you'll be able to find it in, in the back here, but it is a notation. I've looked at this so many times. No, um, it's, it's numbered nine and it's the first okay. paragraph. Okay. Very cool. I think Johannes has a good video about the concept of irony somewhere. What was that? I think, uh, sorry, I think Johannes had, um, had a, a video, a good video where he, he introduced me to the, the concept of irony. I can't remember what it was called now, but um, maybe I'll comment it below if I remember it. And then uh, my, uh, my other question has to do, uh, you know, I, I like to uh, mood, mood is something I think about too, um, especially coming from uh, being interested in Heidegger. Um, what do you think, because interesting, you know, I was in, the, I was in a, a, a mainstream bookstore, so like a commercial bookstore the other day, and the philosophy section, it was a huge bookstore and the philosophy section was like one, you know, little tiny shelf and it was most, and like, I seriously, they must have had seven or eight different editions of Marcus Aurelius's meditations. Like that is the classic that sells, I guess. And then tons of like, you know, daily stoic, how to be a stoic, stoic every day, like stoicism is everywhere. And at least some parts of stoicism you know, like, like at least the kind of Descartes likes your, your, they would call it emotions, you know, but they would probably classify moods as emotions. Those cloud your rationality. Those get in the way of a proper distance and a proper judgment where if you're very, if you're, if you're feeling angry or you're feeling sad or you're feeling overly happy, these are all uh, dangers to clear, rational thinking and judgment. And there's a kind of uh, almost a vilification of, you know, any kind of, you know, even the word, like if you're brooding on something, Heidegger likes to use that in like a positive way. But you, if we say that like in every day, sense, like you're brooding on something, it's like, you shouldn't be doing that. You're, you're, you're brooding on your, on your, you're letting your emotions stew and fester. And you should be kind of you know, doing something else with them. I just, I just wonder if you had any thoughts or comments on sort of this, uh, this, this fact of like stoicism and it's sort of reticence to, to the, to mood and emotion. What, what, if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah. The, I share your vision of the bookshelf in mainstream bookstores. The, I think part of my own, my own theory is, Oh, I, sorry, Matthew. Can I just interrupt oh, yeah. you? Yes. Uh, Barish has to has to leave. So, Barish, do do you want to say a few words before you pop off? <laughs> sorry, I did not mean to interject, but yeah. Yeah, but uh, it happened now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actuality, you came quickly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, I'm sorry. I just, just uh, couldn't prepare my uh, talk. I had something in. I could know. I mean, I, I guess that's why I'm here, uh, like attending these courses, so that I'm just become an integrator. And finally, maybe I, I find that you know, desire in its most, most intense to whatever it is that I want to write to. Apparently, maybe it didn't kind of uh, find a good avenue in me uh, this time. So uh -huh. anyway, I just uh, really want to thank thank everybody. Uh, for the thought provoking uh, you know talks and um yeah uh i really course itself as i mentioned to you before and uh, the breakout sessions and the main you know discussion sessions so uh yeah i, I don't have anything to you know say substantial really so what well, do you want to say something about the substantial self you substantial things you would have said you know just to give us a teaser uh, well, the, 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 the idea was really, yeah, I just, uh, it was more like uh, the motivation for me was um, in the last session, uh, Leonard Tark asked, uh, what is philosophy? 
And I said something like, it is what we are doing, but uh, the, the, the philosophy itself is really about defining it, putting into words, and, you know, explicating it. So my, uh, my idea was to really, uh, what drives it uh, in a way, sort of maybe alludes to what Matthew is asking, where does that desire come from? And it was sort of trying to explicate that, the desire to explicate things mm -hmm. uh, in, our, in our minds. Uh, that was the driving force. But as I said, it wasn't well integrated. I had some paragraphs, but they were not you know, well connected together. But the gist of it was really what is philosophy and what drives them. There was kind of a connection to your seminar so that's uh, as the main limiter in our lives uh, this kind of drives uh, philosophy was kind of the building blocks of it mm -hmm. okay. it's, as I said it's a it's a fragmentary thing even even now so, but but this is something I, I would try to write uh, for myself as well and hopefully maybe share at some point okay but it's yeah definitely something really important and interesting i mean what's one of the things hegel uses to get his encyclopedia going is speak of the need of philosophy before he even gets into philosophy proper he speaks about the need for it right. and that how yeah. how how when we're contemplating we're already kind of in between on the way to do philosophy but not there yet and yet it's it's sort of we're on a drive or momentum that's pulling us forward somewhere Yes, okay, thanks. I mean, thanks, Barish. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Have a good one. Bye. See, see Take you around, care. man. Bye. Take care. Bye. Have a good weekend. Oh, is that cops calling now? <laughs> <laughs> what have you I'm been thinking, wrong. Barish? <laughs> <laughs> it's the thought police. <laughs> Anyway, yes, I'm just walking to uh, meet my kids. <laughs> okay, <Bye. laughs> okay pl uh, please continue, Matthew. Sorry to, to break off. Oh, no, you're, you're good. Uh, that was great. So I want to thank Lou for the question. The um... So I share your vision on the shelf. I haven't dug through all the ravines of the Stoics because I know there are many, but one thing that stuck out to me is ingredient to their thought is they were the original analytic philosophers, right? They were concerned with developing a language that was pure and would mirror a pure, they wouldn't say this, but consciousness towards the noose, right? The thing that was in the center or in the midst of the things giving, giving momentum, meaning to the swirl. So they were very very concerned with saying the right things at the right time with the right intention, because they were in a weird way, they were about the purgation of the, of the, of the pathos, right. Of the emotion, as you said so well, but what I think is interesting in terms of the distribution of books nowadays, popular books and why it's on the shelf is it seems to be in conversation with itself now. And so when someone picks up a Marcus Aurelius, I think they're picking up a two for one. They're picking up the smattering of, the, the hunt for a scientific knowledge through analytic concepts anchored in language. But it's all filtered through the mood of, of the man himself. What's his name? The, the one who wrote it, Marcus Aurelius. It's all filtered through Marcus Aurelius. And so Marcus Aurelius as avatar becomes the mood for the entire Stoic tradition. So it's, I mean, there's, there is a tension there in the way, in the way framed. And, but, I, but I think perhaps some way that it's not necessary, but in some way this, this could be, this dearth of other books could be the void from which much fruit grows because persona is an interesting topic. And that literally means to sound through and to use that old concept of organon and instrument for attunement. I know we talked about attunement before. In many ways, the, the fact, the facticity of Marcus Aurelius being on the shelf 
is a proposed solution to the problem of how to introduce one to the conversation. And this running theory is you set up a mood and a tune and they chose Marcus Aurelius. Now, I don't know why he was selected, but I'm interested in the methodology of what was conceived as the optimal gate. And lastly, attunement, I think, is, is not something I'm making up, but in, I'm very concerned with motion. In the De Anima, Aristotle distinguished two kinds of sound, phone, phony. The one sound in general, so the sound the leaves make when the wind rustles, and then the sound a human being makes when they cry or wail or speak. And one, it's, and, and you can find a kind of, you could find a gradient of attunement here. And you could do, you could do quite a lot with that distinction. Um, he took the whole idea of what animates objects and slashed a large population of objects in space from what he took to be a human being. And if we don't consider that just a given anthropology, we might see in the choice something similar to how people decide to use books as gateways to these abstract things known as the scale of forms, which is the philosophical conversation. So I, I really think persona, sound, and attunement is everywhere. And it certainly plays a role in advertising, which means it's, in, it's somewhere embedded in how human beings relate to one another. Now, that's not anything specific, but that's, that's how I think through those things now. Only really short, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, I have to go and I want to thank you all for the great course, uh, of course, you, Philip, and um, the great evening today. So thank you very much. And Thanks, Leonard, evening. for your really thank you. insightful Thanks. and impressive talk. That's given us lots to think about. Thanks. Have a nice evening, everyone. You too, Leonard. Take care, man. To see you around. Um, yes, uh, I also need to be going in a short while. So I just want to ask Leo if you have any thoughts or ideas you would like to to bring up. Oh well, no, I, I wasn't planning on on presenting anyway. No, no, I know, but like you know, in, I'm just asking if you have any thoughts or ideas, not presentations per se. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, yeah, I, I have thoughts and ideas. No, but I, I also you know, find it difficult trying to convey them. So, <laughs> yeah, you don't want to tell us about that difficulty. Oh, um, well, no, it's you kind of everybody. Hopefully, you kind of knows about it. you know my my discipline is mathematics, and there's a certain way things are done there. And that's, you know, it's, it's not an accident for me that that's where I'm coming from. So I, I, I really do prefer that, 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 I, that I, that I trust. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to really, I, one of the inside, I mean, I did, uh, by the way, yeah, I, I took tutorials from, uh, from Philippe throughout the course. So we met a, a week and a half ago and uh, at the end of that, I was kind of, toying with the idea maybe maybe i would present something but then the net effect of it was i kind of realized that you know i don't I'm not i'm not really a philosopher <laughs> i have i feel the attraction for it and i do want to interact with it but i really do not know how to speak that way you know so for, for me the the image still is always mathematical as as the, the grounding for how to speak Yeah. So having having said that, you can see why I'm silent. <laughs> but there is something you do want to say in 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 philosophy that not uh, clear. That's not not at all clear. Yeah. I, again, you know, my relation with philosophy has been to read philosophers, and but but my attempt to read them is to try to ground what they're saying is something that makes sense to me as a mathematician. So it's not clear that I have what I have with my own that I want to say. You know. Can I uh, ask you a question? As a mathematician, um, uh, Leo, do, do you feel that um, language 
could have um, a similar algebraic quality um, that um, algebra has that number had. I mean, is it is it just as you know um, sort of arbitrary that I'm using this word? Let's say I don't know. Let's take the concept to say marriage, and I say I say the word marriage. Um, might I just as well use any other word to describe that concept in the way that you would do as a mathematician? Just a yeah, yeah. No, my 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 my, my opinion about the things was no. I mean, you, you know, I, I I have I feel no sense of wanting wanting to replace natural language with all its richness with any anything mathematical. But I, I, I do feel this huge urge to be able to have the clarity of what's mathematical as something one can point to as helping to clarify what's going on in the natural la language with all its hmm. mm -hmm. So you think that the, the number, the mathematics might give us some deeper insight into what's happening with natural languages? But Well, it, 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 again, it's, 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 for me, it's, it's there for clarity. You know, that, that there you actually clarify what's being said and also remove yourself from it. Um, if I'm going to actually say anything, I might as well say the one thing that did happen to me dur during the, this uh, first seminar because of the question of the uh, put out the light, and, you know, where, where it is from Shakespeare. <laughs> and the, the two options were, you know, it seems to be definitely from Macbeth, but the other option would, would have been uh, in, in Othello you know, uh, put out the light and then put out the light. And there he goes about, you know, uh, if I quench thee, thy flaming minister, put out the actual light, I can, I can thy light restore. And then he looks at us, uh, does Demona, but once I put out thy light, I know not where is the Promethean heat that can thy light restore. So, uh, and, and... That's incredible. Yeah, but that, that's the kind of dilemma I feel because on the one hand, I feel really, really strongly about wanting to put out the light, the Desdemona type light, just remove yourself, anything alive totally from it all and get that final clarity where you can finally, finally hear what you're actually trying to say. And then there's the dilemma. Having done that, how do you, how do you, you know, where is the Promethean heat that can, can get, get it active again? <laughs> so they're, they're both very, very desirable. You know. <laughs> well, thanks, Leo. Now, that mathematically, was... uh, pardon, sorry, yeah, yeah, no, please. please go on. Well, no, you know, well, mathematically, it's, it's, I didn't, it didn't even occur to me before this, this pro seminar. You know, mathematically, there's no, there's, a, of course, we have the previous CM heat. You just kind of, there you go. You know, you're still there, you just uh, re reoccupy it, and now it's alive again. Did you say reoccupy? Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. Thank you. you know, I, again, the process of math is to just re remove yourself totally from it, produce something with nothing alive, nothing of you left, so you can actually finally look at it and say, oh, that's what I'm saying. And then, of course, you know, you, 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 you read it again, and you can, you can as they say, reoccupy it. it. Let your intuitions flow back into it. But it feels much, much more delicate in, in, in philosophy. Sophia doesn't quite work that way, maybe. <laughs> Did you say it feels much more dark in philosophy? Oh, no. Well, no. Uh, it, quite, I would almost say the opposite. You, you, you know, it's a huge mistake to, to, to turn out, put out the light in philosophy. <laughs> I mean, in philosophy, things are, are alive. They're pulling you towards something. And it's a mistake to cut yourself off from that. Mm, yeah. Although, why would you cut yourself off from that in the first place? To get the clarity. To fi finally see what, what are you actually talking about. So, so cutting off is, seems like an enriching of that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's my experience, you know, but both professionally and before and after, you know, that, uh, you know, th things seem so muddled unless they're made clear. I simply mm. have that kind of mind. 
I think there's a profound connection here with the theme of the event. I don't, I don't know how to explicate it, but I've been thinking about, I'm, I'm enrolled in the Heidegger course and I'm looking forward to it, especially in the heels of this conversation, because I've been thinking to myself, I will go through Heidegger to find the event. But now as you, I mean, as I wrote everything you said down, as, as you talked about reoccupying, I thought David Hume's memory in his essay concerning human understanding, where he defines memory as comprised of two components, contiguousness, where things touch. Interesting that he uses the word touch there, not taste, not sight, not anything that gathers, but and where you get the liminal, liminal and succession, the passing, the flow. But in, in this, I mean, this is, a, this is a strange way to think about memory because it allows for bare places to remember, to, to put members in, but it doesn't, it doesn't prescribe the members. It doesn't, it doesn't say anything about them. And so I see, I'm not a mathematician, but I see in the people, Hume later in his life didn't like the book, Enquiry Concerning Human Nature. He thought it was too abstract or someone said that about him because he was busy writing the history of Europe in his latter years. But early on, he was, I think he was doing with memory what I'm hearing you describe as evental for, for math, for mathematician, qua mathematician. So I, I don't know if you're comfortable with the language of event or if you would say anything about that from your experience, because I think oh. it has something, and finally, it has something to do with the middle voice where, as you said, you see yourself what you were trying to say. That seeing yourself, not, not, the, not the sense of seeing your reflection, but to see yourself, yourself seeing it. Um, that, that strikes me as an event. So if you want to say anything about that. Well, for, for me, uh, again, my main philosophical connection is Heidegger. So event is a rightness for me. And uh, your mention of uh, remember for me, strongly brings to mind uh, Holderon's poem, uh, Minosomy, uh, where, again, near, near the end of the, of the first uh, of the three stanzas, um, the, uh, the, the word Aragnes, Aragnes, appears. Um, What's the title? Oh, uh, Minosomy, the goddess yes. of, of memory. Oh, oh it, it, it's the version... Um, Oh, uh, that's the first stanza starts with, uh, you know, a, a sign we are, uh, you know, uh, painless, senseless, something like that. There's, there's two versions of the first stanza, so it's that one. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> so this poem, this poem, in this poem, you remember, remembering. Yeah. So and that 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 connects for me now with what what, what I'm saying when. One of the main things I think that's being done, uh, that's occurring to me right now in mathematics, when you finally do kill the light, you know, kill the flame, cut everything off, is again, it's it's like the uh, the end in in Heidegger. So it's in particular non-relational. So you've you've cut off the the life of connections uh, when you finally you know, do that. There, you know, there, there's something going on, flowing that's not totally you because you're you're sharing yourself with you know everyone else, and then you cut it all off for the end, for the clarity of the end. It's kind of confusing to me. I got to admit, with whatever mind I have, you know, how how do you actually speak if you're not at the end? <laughs> You know, how, how do you know what to say? Because you're not at the end, right? <laughs> well, you figure it out as you go along. <laughs> you know, there, there, you, might have, a... you might have some vague notion about going somewhere, but some direction, there, but not sp in uh, detail of what's, what's on the... There, there, the... There, there's this movie, I don't know if anybody knows that, called uh, Searching for Bobby Fisher, about this young uh, uh, chess player uh Watkins I think and, and there's a couple of scenes in it where when he's, he's learning from his tutor and being told you know don't move until you see it 
and he, you know, and then reply, I don't see it. Don't move until you see it. But I don't see it. Don't move until you see it. And then at the climax of the movie, the same thing happens in a tournament where his mind's got doing that. He's, he's not moving. He's just, you know, five, ten minutes until he finally sees it. Because if you move before you see it, you know, who knows what's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a problem of teleology. <laughs> so that, that's I, the way. I mean, again, you know, oh, mathematics doesn't really deal with life. So, you know, that makes sense in mathematics. It doesn't make sense in life. So it's a certain, you know, strange version of Sophia, maybe. <laughs> Just a quick mm, commentaria. The a verse from the Bible for a long time in the Greek, the Attic Greek, asked for my attention. It was something that I, I had to think and ponder, ponder slowly. The, in the English, in many translations, it says, love never fails. But I thought, in the Greek, what is going on? And it's quite, it's quite exciting in the Greek, in a staid way. So it's paradoxical. It says, love falls. But the whole movement of the sentence is the between. Love, not even, at any time, falls. And I thought to myself, no idea what love is, no idea what falling could look like, but so much intensity is given to this negation, double negation, perhaps, of not even at any time. And I, I, I remember a, a professor telling me once that, this was abstract. And I thought to myself, that's a strange thing because I used to associate love with sentiment. And so I wonder about the clarity of love. I mean, that seems to be a clear, clear sentence, but I don't feel that I have advanced. And yet it seems worth attention. So I, I'm, I'm going to use what you said about clarity of the end that seems very eschatological, right? It concerns the end. And in particular, non-relational, but I'm going to use it with that verse because I wonder what happens with my own theory of moods. What happens to the things that seem so, per so feelingful? What happens when they're abstracted? Uh, what, you know, what does clarity do at a distance? So I, I think it's out, out. I'm going to look up that Desdemona thing. Out, out. I guess what I'm really going after is the paradox. All that to say paradox, I think is key here of finding the middle, perhaps with the end, paradoxical relations as opposed to straightforward ones, oh. somehow. Thanks for that, Matthew. That uh, passage about mm -hmm. love, that's it's very interesting, yeah. Oh. Uh, it sort of reminds me of what love for Hegel is, which is basically the concept. He just said it straight out to the logic that, yeah, love is the concept. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he also speaks a lot about falling as well there. Um, he has this, um, this quote, I think I've maybe mentioned it already here before. You know, the ripest maturity, the highest stage that anything can attain is one at which it fall begins. Uh -huh. And so, you know, falling in love, love being this thing that turns everything upside down. And much the same also occurs when you get something and you understand, you know, ah, this is what Spinoza was about, or this is what Wittgenstein, or, you know, you know, th this mathematical thing or what have you. When you get it, it's like something fundamentally shifts, more or less. I think so early on. Uh, Mr. Philip, you, Philip, you said something about discipline. I know, I just felt like saying Mr. Epstein, I don't know why. Probably because right now I'm, I'm deferring to you because I, I, I'm very thankful for this course. But what I want to say in particular is early on, I, I believe it was the first lecture, you said something about the dignity of philosophy as a discipline. And, and it, 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 was, it wasn't a uh, pastime, it was a discipline. And I, I, gave, that, I gave that considerable thought what are the conditions under which it is a discipline? And I think one of 
one of the conditions is you find, and this is more a phrenesis thing, a, a thing you see out in the wild. Philosophers have devotees. Their memory is carried forward by their champions, their lovers, their, and I don't mean erotic love, but there, there's a, there's a, there is a, I'm sure a word in the Greek for a love that carries on the icon. And so, like you said, when, when, it, when someone finally understands the aha moment of the concept for a philosopher, that switch, because it seems irreversible and maybe it is, the grasping for that philosopher to use them in language, to use them as dialogue partner, to use them is a way of reoccupying the, the event of the switch. Cause I, I don't know when the particular switch happened for me in fear and trembling or anyone who's been turned on to philosophy through a philosopher could find, but they perhaps can find the reoccupations. So I, I think devotion Devotion to a philosopher is part and parcel of the, the carrying on of philosophy. Yeah, um, it's not worship, obviously, but it's it's like a it's a it's a it's a pleasure in the company of sort of thing in that direction. A commitment, right? Um, you are committed to at this project because you feel it's important and it's important independently of, of you in some sense or but also it's giving you some you know immediate satisfaction pleasure and it's interesting and as Zizek says you know why be happy when you can be interesting <laughs> but it but as a discipline you know that entails at work and and you know, that contains periods of anguish, despair, and um, uh, toil, not. right? And Hegel is very honest about this, and a lot of philosophers are. It's not easy. I find, I find it quite lonely when I, you know, because I, I, I find there's something I'm interested in, and then I try and maybe talk to somebody who's not studying philosophy, and I try and communicate it, and um, I don't know, most of the time, it's, you know, it just doesn't sort of speak to them. It doesn't chime with anything. So I find it quite hard. You know, th these are, you know, very rare oasis. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I try and translate it into like, a, give a brief overview to people, but um, something I've found or read or discovered, but um, there I say, yeah, most people just aren't sort of very interested or uh, just don't get it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think you have that problem, Steve? Imagine <laughs> what Plato must have felt, or Heidegger, or you know Kant. It's like, holy shit! I have these explosive ideas in my mind. How <laughs> the hell am I gonna, you know, communicate this? You know, <laughs> the it. I think half the struggle of philosophy is just, uh, you know, uh, talking to people about it, communicating it, and and awakening it in others. So you're definitely not alone there. I mean, that, that's part of the discipline. <laughs> <laughs> I just put up a quote about contradiction in, in the chat, uh, if you're interested, Matthew, because you talked about paradoxes. Thank you. Uh, people, uh, we need to uh, close, the, close the session because I need to get going. Um, so uh, yeah, final, final remarks, final sentences. Please, please speak now. Well, it's been a pleasure to meet you and I've enjoyed your company a lot, Philip. And um, I hope uh, you'll still, you'll stay part of uh, one of the guildsmen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're in the guild. So yeah, it was a really good, and it was really thoughtful the way you uh, designed the course so that it wasn't just like a book reading, but you introduced all of these different um, philosophers along with the key text. I thought that was great the way you, you sort of structured it. So um, I appreciate the thought you put into it. And um, yeah, hopefully we can do something again together. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I hope so too. Well, uh, I will, I'm definitely part of the guild. I'm one of the guildsmen and uh, something is in the, in the works for autumn. Cool, so, cool. Yeah. That's awesome. But other than that, I'm, I'm hanging out on the forum and always around. 
it's been my sincere pleasure to meet all of you. Thank you for, uh, for doing what you do and having the, the courage to do it idiosyncratically. I love seeing the differences. I, and this comes from a real place. I studied philosophy in college and it was a probably maybe a thousand plus people. It was a big research and development school. And in the philosophy classes, I think there were four professors. The ones I would go to, there were four people. And there was the temptation so many years ago to put it down, but I didn't and found a community out there of people who do it unabashedly. So I just want to say it's, it's a very, it's, it's something I appreciate and recognize and uh, glad to be in this square that I am. That's great to hear. Thanks, Matthew. Mm -hmm. This was a real, real pleasure. Um, I'm really happy to uh, have discovered this part of Collingwood that I didn't know existed. So I appreciate Phil doing that. And I've learned so much from conversations with uh, everybody here and those who are, who are not here. Um, so yeah, really, really good experience.